I love Christmas carols. And every time I go in the grocery store or a mall or Target, I just get in a good mood because I hear the music playing. And I hope you do too. I'm going to see if you know some of these songs. Okay, now I'm going to kind of sing just a little bit and see if you can sing the rest. But, tis the season to be jolly. <laughs> okay. Love and joy come to you. Wassle too. <laughs> Have a holly jolly Christmas. It's the oh, yeah. it's the most wonderful time. You know, I'm so glad you're here, Sandy. You know these songs, baby. Joy to the world. All right, joy. That seems to be a pretty big theme for Christmas. And today on this third Sunday of Advent, this Sunday is known as Joy Sunday. For the past two weeks, we've been talking about the different symbols that communicate the true meaning for Christmas, and certainly joy is right up there at the top of the list. We could make a good case, actually, that the Christian faith is basically about joy. The psalmist said it so often, Let the earth rejoice, so come let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. And I could go on with about 50 verses of joy in the Psalms, but I won't. Uh, but joy is talked about in other places. The prophets, the prophet Isaiah wrote, With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Sing aloud and sing for joy. And today, I just read two scripture passages that were both about joy. Now the first one came from the prophet Zephaniah. Now has anybody in here ever read Zephaniah? Ah. Yeah, didn't think so. It is probably the least known book of the Bible. It is only three chapters long, and you probably had trouble finding it if you looked for it. Zephaniah is one of the uh, prophets we call a minor prophet, not because he wasn't important, but because there were 12 prophets that wrote very short scriptures. And all 12 of those prophets were written on one scroll. And so they were called minor prophets because... All their writings held on one scroll, whereas the, the prophet Jeremiah, his whole book is on one scroll, one book on one scroll. So Jeremiah's major prophet, uh, Zephaniah, and some of the others are minor prophets. Now what Zephaniah writes, though, is one of the grimiest, saddest, gloomiest books in the whole Bible. The time is the 6th century B.C.E., and Judah and the religious reforms of King Josiah are now in the past. The temple and the city of Jerusalem and the Davidic monarchy were all destroyed. It was a time of public and social crisis because Israel had lost its place in the world. There were people were turning away from God to other religions and there was complacency and there were corrupt leaders. Just the whole picture was not good. And the people didn't know how to continue. They didn't know how to believe in God who had allowed the very sign of his presence, the temple, to be destroyed. That's the time in which Zephaniah writes. And it was the greatest crisis and darkest hour for the Israelite nation. And so two and a half chapters of the book of Zephaniah are all a pretty brutal assault upon the people for allowing what happened to happen. They were to blame. They followed after kings who did not know the Lord, who did evil in the sight of the Lord. And all seems hopeless. And so you've read like two and a half chapters of Zephaniah, just this brutal stuff, and then all of a sudden, there's this drastic change when you get to where we read today. There's hope. Zephaniah said, all is not lost. And the people are to rejoice. Why? Because God loves his children. In fact, God takes delight in his people and will rescue them from their enemies. Apparently, there's something more going on here than all the evil and injustice and despair in the world. Because that despair is still going on. They are still in captivity with the Babylonians. There is lots of yucky stuff, but there's something more important going on than the gloom that the prophet sees in the world. There is a light 
shining in the darkness. Now, many centuries later, another person talks about a light amidst the darkness, and he talks about rejoicing. And that was the Apostle Paul. Paul is sitting in a dark, dank cell somewhere in the Roman Empire. We don't really know where he is at this point, but we know that he was on his way to Rome, most likely to be executed. And what he does is he writes a letter to his friends in the church at Philippi. And they are facing persecution and torture and death. And what he says to them is, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Now, it's not some like Pollyannish, phony cheerfulness. This is something that dwells or wells up deep from inside a person's soul. Something is, that is grounded in a reality more real and more powerful than any jail cell, any physical torture, more real than death itself. Rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Adam Potke, uh, in his book, The Story of Joy, argues that joy is not only a human capacity, but is, is integral to our life. Medical science knows all about it. In fact, joyful people are inclined to be healthier and to deal with physical catastrophes in a much more positive and successful way. I'm sure we all remember the self-designed study or experiment done by the late Norman Cousins. He had the, the acute and painful blood disease, and so he treated himself with laughter by watching funny uh, movies all day long, and he actually started feeling better. And researchers discovered that laughter truly does stimulate the brain to produce the things that help us cope with pain. But, Potke says, most people are not joyful. Most people live joyless lives. So why is that? Maybe it's because life can seem like an uphill battle. So much of what we encounter is conducive to rejoicing. I mean, rejoice always. Don't worry about anything. Easier said than done because we do worry. We have bills to pay and children to raise, mortgages and home improvements and college tuitions. We have less money than we had a year ago, and everybody wants it in this season of the year. We worry about our cholesterol, our weight, and the state of the union. And Christmas, for some of us, is particularly stressful because there's so much to do to get ready, and we want everything to be perfect. For some reason, the relentless cheerfulness on television almost accentuates our grief over the loss of a loved one, for our fears for our own lives or that of our family, for our fears for our nation, our fears concerning our health. And we think if we can just buy that joy. Barbara Brown Taylor, who's an Episcopal priest and a writer, I think puts it rather strikingly. She says, I don't have a million dollars or any plausible way of coming up with a million dollars, so I seek happiness with smaller treasures, like really nice clothes, and a set of copper-bottomed cookware. And most recently, a Parker Duofold fountain pen with an 18-karat gold nib. Now, contrary to much of my religious education, these things really do make me happy, and I enjoy wearing them and handling them and seeing them and using them. But the truth is, they are dismal failures at bringing me joy. When I wake up in the middle of the night and I can't go back to sleep for all the fears that are taking turns sitting on my chest, it never occurs to me to get up and get my 13-inch frying pan and bring it to bed with me. Like most everything else that happens, um, most everything else that brings me happiness, that's a daytime comfort, not a nighttime one. In the middle of the night when the sound of my doomed heart banging my ears, there's no getting around the fact that most of the things that I think bring me joy are incomplete. And I realize that my only safe investment turns out to be whether I can abide with God. If we are painfully aware or painfully honest with ourselves, don't we all seek joy at times through our flat screen televisions or our tile floors or our purchase of guns, or our joy in movies and video games and sporting events. Everybody turned around and looked at Kevin. I had to say that, you know. <laughs> or our joy in movies. Nancy went to see a movie yesterday. Um, 
We seek joy in the market and in our retirement. We seek joy in our weekends and our vacations. We seek joy in the music and the arts. And those things can make us happy. And happy is good. But happy for this long can mask the fact that we do not have a deep and abiding joy. With happiness, one day the market crashes. And we no longer have money to pay our bills. And suddenly we realize how empty happiness can be. We realize how incomplete we are without God's joy. So you may be asking if God's joy is different from happiness, what does joy look like? What symbol could we put on our Starbucks coffee cup that communicates joy? Well, think of the words written by the man who was in jail on the way to his death. Rejoice in the Lord always. And the one he followed, Jesus. Jesus, on the very last evening of his life, when he's just a couple of hours away from his crucifixion, sitting at a table with his friends, eating their very last meal, he says, I've said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. There's something going on here, something at the heart of the biblical witness that is so amazing, so powerful, that the only appropriate response is joy. Not penitence, not guilt, not remorse, not criticism, but joy. And where does joy come from? Jesus tells us that joy comes from abiding in God. Joy comes from being in the presence of God, spending time with God. Jesus tells us if we obey God's command to abide in God's love, we're not God's servants anymore, but we're his friends. We're in a relationship with him. God's joy comes from a relationship, a connection with God. And when we have that joy, nothing can overwhelm us. A pastor friend of mine a, a month or so ago conducted a funeral for a young man who was killed on uh, uh, the tollway 130. Some of you heard about it. He had two children and a wife. And the wife told my friend that when she got home, and he had no idea who was going to be killed. I mean, it was, but by his computer was a little post it note, and all that post it note it said Joy is not the absence of suffering, joy is the presence of God. A note may be left for his wife. The joy is not the absence of suffering, but the presence of God. Joy comes from a relationship, from abiding with God. And that presence, that joy will get you through whatever you encounter. My dad died at the age of 61 from cancer. And it was a really painful year. The cancer, when they discovered it, had already metastasized in his bones in several locations. And it was really, really hurt. Uh, one night, Kevin and I went to visit him in the hospital. It was about a, his last month in the hospital before he came home. And he had had a really stressful day that day. My mom, trying to love on him, had sat down on his bedside and pulled out that IV. Well, his veins were shot. Every nurse in that hospital tried to get that IV back in and couldn't. In fact, all the doctors that happened to be at the hospital tried to get that IV back in and couldn't. They called in the surgeon to come back to the hospital, and the surgeon was able to finally put it back in. It was very stressful, very painful. We walked in the room, and he was white as a ghost, ghost and a little cranky. But he told us in very nice terminology about my loving mother, who was sitting down to give him a hug and pulled his IV. Well, finally, he looked up at Kevin. Now, Kevin and I were 27 at the time. He said, Kevin, I need a little help. You see, he needed to go to the bathroom. He needed to use the urinal. At that time, there was no way his 27-year-old daughter would be in the room when that would happen, and he couldn't do it by himself. So I left the room, and Kevin picks up the urinal. You know, kind of looks like a milk carton cut off at the top, right? Well, few, I'm standing in the hall, and I hear this just loud, boisterous laughter. Kevin's looking down back there. He's already embarrassed because he knows what I'm going to say. Uh, coming from the room, and I'm thinking, what is going on in there? They cannot be laughing because it had been pretty somber. So finally, I knock on the door and come in, and they are just sobbing, laughing. Kevin is actually on the floor, and uh, I'm like, what happened? And Kevin can't tell me. He's laughing too hard, and my dad said, well, 
um, Kevin went to help, and he got the urinal, and he didn't want to, you know, look at his father-in-law, so he goes, okay. <laughs> and he said, after a minute, I said, uh, Kevin, what goes up has to come down. <laughs> and they dissolved into laughter. Now, what a precious moment of joy right there. You know, he could have been saying, you blah, 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 do you know how to use a urinal? Have you ever peed in your urinal? You've ever had the kind of pain I had laying in this bed? What does he do? Uh, makes a joke. And they dissolve in laughter, and joy filled that room. The joy of the Lord is our strength. You know, we will experience tough times. But as the psalmist says, weeping may last for the night, but joy comes with the morning light. We have a reason to be joyful because no matter what we encounter, God delights in you and in me. God rejoices in that. And God in Jesus brings us joy. In a dark Night long ago, shepherds were startled by a sky full of lightning and a messenger from God who said, Don't be afraid, because I am bringing good news to you of great joy. A little later, wise men from the east came to Bethlehem, and when they, when they saw the sky, Matthew tells us they were overwhelmed with joy. From Jesus' birth to his death 33 years later and his resurrection three days after that. The story of Jesus Christ is a story of joy. Because of the birth of a child in Bethlehem, there's good news of a great joy to all people, wherever they are, whoever they are, and whatever is happening to them. Because of the man the child became and the love and the compassion he embodied and he shared, there is joy. Because his followers have found in him courage and hope in times of suffering and tragedy, there is joy. Because Jesus made sure that there was nothing that could ever separate us from God's presence, there is joy. And because today in whatever circumstances we find ourselves, God comes to each one of us and accepts us and loves us, and forgives us, and embraces us, and strengthens us, and loves us, giving us abundant and everlasting life. So in the noise and the busyness of this hectic season, listen. Listen for that voice that says, Behold, I bring you good news of a great joy. Think about, God is right there with you. God is right there with you. God will give you joy in every situation. Let us rejoice in the Lord always. Please join me in prayer. Gracious and most holy God, thank you for being with us. And may your love the confidence of your love, just fill us with joy so we may be able to handle anything we encounter and may others see that joy in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.